Well, good morning, church. Well, that was kind of weak there. Good morning, church. There we go, there we go. There was this atheist speaking with a Christian man, and the atheist said, I don't believe God exists. And the Christian man thought for a moment and said, I don't think God thinks you exist either. And the atheist quickly responded and said, what do you mean? He has to believe I exist. He created me. In Genesis 127, it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God is the creator, and you know something? He's excellent at it. It's not messed up because of him. His creation was perfect. He saw all that he created, and it was good. The truth of the matter is, what God has done in creation is beyond our comprehension. Not just in matter, but in species and animals and beings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know that there are 10,000 species of birds in the world? There are over a hundred, well, there's a hundred to 400 billion individual birds on planet Earth right now. And that's just on this planet, and that's just birds. When I say it's just on this planet, I mean he created galaxies. But then he's created 400 billion birds on the planet right now. That's just birds. I think when you get overwhelmed with something, you can call on the one that's got it all under control. If he can keep up with 400 billion birds, let alone all the other species and other animals and human beings and the world itself and the universe itself, I I think think he's he's got this. I think he can handle it. Do you know how many cells are in the human body? In an adult lady, there are 28 trillion. So God is massive, and yet he knows about every cell in your body. Men, if you want bragging rights, you got it on this one. In the adult man, there are 36 trillion cells. There's hundreds of cell types, all designed by the Creator. I can't imagine hearing that and saying everything's by chance, it was just a big boom. I can't imagine what it takes to believe that. Our God is a marvelous Creator, which leads us to the question, which is the title of the message, why did he create you? Why did he create you? You have a fingerprint that is not only different from all the other billions of people on planet earth, you have a fingerprint that is unique to you that is different from every human being that has ever lived. You have a DNA strand running through your body that is unique to you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So stop degrading yourself. You are God's handiwork, and it is good. If you're going to be hard on yourself, be hard on yourself about what you've made it, not about how he made you. So it leads us to ask, why did he create you? Colossians chapter 1 is where we are. Colossians chapter 1, if you found the text, please join me in standing for the reading of God's Word. We'll be reading verses 13 through 17. Verse 13 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold 
together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege we'll have tomorrow to read Colossians 1 and to read these verses again. And so I pray, Lord God, at this time you would open our minds and hearts to understand your word just a little bit better. Speak, O Lord, that we may know you and know your word, to what we may experience you afresh today. Remind us of how great you are and remind us of why we exist. This is our prayer and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. In verse 13 it says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Now what that tells me is each and every human being on planet earth starts out in the domain of darkness. If you don't know Jesus, today you're living in the domain of darkness. But when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, he transfers you from darkness to the kingdom of the Son, Jesus Christ. Now notice According to verse 13, it's talking about the Father here. He, the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His Son. The kingdom is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the Father is the one that rescued us from where we once were to where we are now. For all believers. Verse 14 says we learn that, we learn there that Christ Jesus did to what he did to provide the means for the Father to rescue us, it says, in him, now that's speaking about in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word redemption here means to let go free due to a ransom being paid. Now please get that. You who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ have been transferred from darkness to the kingdom of Jesus because Jesus paid a ransom for you. He paid a debt you couldn't pay. He paid the price that was required when he died upon the cross. He paid that so that you could be taken out of darkness and placed in light, so he could be taken out of darkness and placed in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, God's beloved son. Woo! That's what he's done for you. So quit degrading yourself. You are valuable to him or he wouldn't have done it. You have worth in the sight of the Lord. And for all who repent and believe that redemption is applied as we just sang about, and now forgiveness has been granted, and he no longer holds your sin against you. Woo, that's a good feeling. Verse 15 says, he, the same one that provided redemption, is the image of the invisible God. God the Son is the image of the invisible God who is God the Father. The Son is the firstborn of all creation according to verse 15. You ever ever paid attention to what God the Father looks like? Well, the Bible does not give us anything about his appearance. You could go to Revelation and look at the throne room of God and the throne and all the shining lights coming from it, but John couldn't even make out an image because of the brightness of what was coming from the throne. See, the Father and the Spirit don't present themselves in a human form, but God the Son did. God the Son is the image of the invisible God. He became visible for mankind to see. John writes about this, God taking on human form, in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Let me read that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we've got God and the Word in the beginning, and both are God. Verse 2, and He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, through the Word. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So who is the word? Later in that same chapter, you scroll down to verse 14, and here's what it says. And the word that was in the beginning as God and with God, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John, who's writing this inspired of God, says, we saw his glory. 
The one that's writing this saw him as the image of the invisible God. He said, we saw his glory, the glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know God the Father, you look to God the Son. In Hebrews chapter 1, it addresses the same truth. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, it says, and he, speaking of Jesus, God the Son, he is the radiance of of his glory. The Son is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature. So when someone looks at God the Son and and sees his nature, that's God the Father's nature. When one looks at Jesus, God the Son, we see the radiance of the Father's glory. Verse 15 concludes from Colossians 1, verse 15 concludes with the firstborn of all creation. Now, we here in the West struggle with this one because our westernized minds see everything in logical order. But that's, it, this is not a statement of timing, first and foremost. It's not saying Jesus was the firstborn human being, as we would just naturally understand it. It is a, it is a word and a description of status. He is the firstborn of all creation, meaning he's superior to all creation. He's before all creation. Look at verse 17, and you'll see a confirmation of this. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, he can't be the firstborn and yet be before what he created. You with me? Verse 17 confirms that firstborn is not talking about a physical birth, but it's saying he is supreme to his creation. He is prior to his creation. In Hebrews chapter 1, I read verse 3 just a moment ago. Let me read verses 1 and 2. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Now, let me stop so we all get this. Stay with me. It's talking about God the Father. How did he speak to us? In the Old Testament, he spoke through the prophets. He spoke through miracles like the burning bush or the talking donkey. Things of that way. Miracles and then through his prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, you know, the prophets. He spoke through them to the people. So that's verse 1, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Now verse 2, in these last days, because this is written, Hebrews is written around 69 A.D. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. Because Jesus has taken on flesh, walked the earth, died on the cross, resurrected from the dead. He says, whom he, whom the Father appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now, this was just when this first hit me. When we read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you want to get technical about which person of the triune God did that, it's God the Son. The one that took on flesh is in the beginning creating the heavens and the earth. It's by the order of the Father. Hey, son, take care of it. Aye, aye, Dad. And the Son did it. And he spoke the universe into existence. Notice what it says. He didn't have to do this to make Jupiter. He spoke, and there's Jupiter. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. God spoke to the prophets of old, then he spoke to his son, whom he appointed him heir of all things, through whom God the Father made the world. It was through the son doing the actual work. So when we read these verses in Colossians chapter 1, you need to realize that the creator of the world is the one that took on flesh. He's the one that walked on water. He's the one that multiplied the fish and the bread to feed the people. He's the one that raised the dead. He's the one that conquered the the grave himself on the third day. The same one that spoke the universe into existence is the one that bled and died for you. Let's look at verse 16 now of Colossians 1. For by him, by God the Son, by Jesus, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So notice three prepositions. Let's do a little English grammar here, okay? Notice three prepositions here, by him. 
You were created by Him, meaning creation happened due to His power. You were created through Him, meaning He is the agent that brought it to pass. And you were created for Him, meaning it's all for His honor and glory. Let's take a look at each of these. Number one, you were created by Him. Verse 16 says, for by Him all things were created created. Him in this verse is God the Son, so no wonder the storms calmed when He spoke to them. No wonder the demons came out of people when He spoke to them. He has all authority. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. No wonder people trembled at His presence. No wonder the lame were healed at His command, arise and walk. He is superior to his creation. He reigns over his creation. All things were created by him. This information is going to be on the screen for you. If the earth were as small as the moon, the power of gravity would be too weak to retain sufficient atmosphere for man's needs. But if it was as large as Jupiter, Saturn, or Uranus, extreme gravitation would make human movement almost impossible. If we were as near to the sun as Venus, the heat would be unbearable. If we were as far away as Mars, we would experience snow and ice every night, even in the warmest regions. If the oceans were half their present dimensions, we would receive only one-fourth the rainfall we do now. If they were one-eighth larger than they are right now, our annual precipitation would increase fourfold, and this earth would become a vast, unhabitable swamp. Water solidifies at 32 degrees above zero. It would be disastrous if the oceans were subject to that law. However, for then the amount of thawing in the polar regions would not balance out and ice would accumulate throughout the centuries. To present, uh, not present, prevent such a catastrophe, the Lord put salt in the sea to alter its freezing point. I tell you what, while I'm burdened about three or four things going on in a regular day, our Lord's got a lot going on and He isn't burdened a bit. He is sustaining our living space. He is sustaining His creation. All things were created by Him. If the ocean wasn't salt water, we'd be messed up. But we're... He knows what he's doing. His creation is wonderful in every detail. Verse 16 says, for by him all things were created. Now, don't misunderstand what that means. His creation was done, and then Adam and Eve chose to sin, and due to sin, aches and pains and aging and hurts and hurting one another through words and actions entered the world. Death entered the world. The very next generation, murder technically entered the world as the fall of man. But it wasn't made that way in the beginning. So we are fallen creatures now due to Adam and Eve's sin, but also you need to know this earth is also cursed. It's also under God's judgment. It is not the perfect earth he created in the beginning. You know how I know that? Because every time I got to mow my lawn, I have to mow a weed. There were no weeds. There were no thorns. All of those are the result of a fallen planet as well. But one day there's going to come a new heaven and what? A new earth. See, he's not just restoring us as individuals to him, and he's not going to just restore us in heaven to him. He's restoring the planet as well one day. All right. I thought that's pretty good. A um, lot to think about. Number two, you were created through him. Verse 16, all things have been created through him. The same Jesus that rose from the dead was the one who put the stars in place. He's the same one that gave the details of the human eye. He's the same one that designed the shape, sizes, speed, and agility of every living creature. 
Folks, our God is creative. If you haven't read your Bible through and through, those seraphim with six wings are some weird looking creatures. They got eyes on all of them. Those four living winged creatures, cherubim, they're, they're weird looking creatures. And then if you just look at all the different animals that God has created, I mean, a kangaroo is weird to look at as they get up on two legs and their arms are this long. That's our God's design. He knows what he's doing, and he is a creative and detailed God. Remember verse 17 of the text, in him all things hold together. He is sustaining his creation. If it wasn't for God, we would drift off. The earth would not stay on its rotation and its axis and gravitational pull and all that. It wouldn't be around the sun like that if the Lord didn't sustain the gravity and the pull and all of those things. Our God is an awesome God. A. Robertson wrote this, the permanence of the universe rests then on Christ far more than on gravity because he's sovereign over the gravity. He's the creator of the gravity. If he removes that, we're in trouble. But God is sustaining his creation. Augustine of old wrote this back 1,500 years ago. Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, the huge waves of the sea, the long course of rivers, the vast compass of the ocean, the circular motion of the stars, but they pass by themselves and don't even notice. What's he saying? We can get so mesmerized by creation that we skip the Creator. Someone can be marvel at such a painting, and yet they talk to someone about it for an hour, but can you imagine them not being able to say who painted it? Not giving credit to the one that did it? All things were created through him. John 1, 3, I read it earlier, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Our Lord Jesus is the creator and sustainer. You know, our problem today is many people are trying to decide what is the purpose of our existence. But if we went into a hangar with a large plane, the plane itself, and though I know the plane can't talk, but the plane itself cannot explain its purpose. A painting itself cannot explain its purpose. You have to ask the painter, you have to ask the designer of the airplane, what was this created for? You know, someone could walk in here and they've never seen a chair before. And you would say, well, that's obvious to sit on. But if you come from the middle of the jungle and the Amazon, they could walk in here and wonder what in the world you're sitting on. And if no one was in the room and they walked in themselves, they'd probably end up sitting on the floor right here, thinking you're supposed to avoid that stuff. It's not obvious. And certainly, when it comes to God's creation, you and I cannot tell each other why we're here. We have to ask the one that created us, designed us, and gave us purpose. So we find out why we are here from God and His Word. It's not a matter of you have an opinion, I have an opinion, someone in the community has an opinion, and someone else has an opinion. It doesn't matter what our opinions are, it matters why we exist. Why are we here? Why did He create you? And you have to go to God to find that answer. You will never realize your purpose by looking within. You have to look to your creator. Number three, you were created for him. Verse 16, all things have been created through him and for him. When someone builds a house, they either build it to live in themselves and benefit from that, or they build a house to sell it and to make a profit. But they're building the house for personal gain. And when the Bible talks about selfishness, it's not talking about it in that way. They, they provided a product, a house, and they receive a payment, and they make a living from it. That's a good thing. 
Well, God is very similar to that in that he created us and he gives us purpose and he wants us to worship him in return. We're not here to simply have fun the way we think of having fun, any, doing anything and everything we want. We're here for him, Amen. not self, Amen. not self, not self. And God, you could say he's selfish about it, but he's fine with that. He tells us in, in, in the word of God, he didn't create us for ourselves. He created us for him. We are to bring honor and glory and delight to him. That is your purpose. Everything else is secondary. You mean I'm not to raise my kids? Yes, that's secondary to the primary purpose of bringing glory to God. And you bring glory to God by being a good parent to your kids. But if you bypass God and just focus on parenting, you miss it. Your purpose is to please him. Therefore, you've got to know the word and then obey it. Many of you are, are pet lovers. Let's just say you like dogs and you see a, a stray dog and you're brokenhearted for that stray dog and you want to take that dog in and you do and you feed that dog and care for that dog. And you say, I did it all for the dog. Well, you did it all for the dog. That's a true statement, but partially. Because you also receive a benefit from ministering to that dog. You receive fulfillment by helping the stray dog. Well, we are not dogs, but God created us and he receives fulfillment by us allowing him to lead us and minister to us, provide for us, guide us, protect us, be our Lord. Y'all aren't, aren't following me on that one. He created us with need of him. And he wants to be in our lives, leading our lives. He wants us, just as that dog comes for the food and is so grateful and got the waggy tail, so giddy to get that food, he wants us to come to him. Some of y'all are really struggling with this human dog comparison, but <laughs> he wants us to come to him giddy and saying, thank you. Amen. Thank you for the food before me. Thank you for the life you've given me. Thank you for the temperament and the personality you've given me. Thank you for the gifts and talents you've given me. Thank you for allowing me to live at such a time as this. Thank you for allowing me to be in the United States, a free country to worship you freely. Thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing me to know what you want from me so I can bring honor and glory to you. Thank you. That's what he wants from you. Sometimes we're too busy to give thanks, and sometimes we're like, God, why haven't you done this for me? When you get to the point where you are ungrateful for God or questioning God, you're a long way from where you were intended to be. Because when you realize all he's done for you, you're grateful. And you realize you have it better than you deserve. You were created for such a time as this. God did not have you live in the 1700s on purpose. He has ordained many events for you to exist today and live here and be in this room right now under the sound of my voice. It is not by accident. You have great worth and great purpose but it's not found on your phone. Amen. It's found in his word. Amen. Your ultimate purpose is found in Jesus. The meaning of life is this. It is, it is to intimately know Jesus and to make him known. Do you know him well? His sheep hear his voice and they know him. Do you know him? And do others know him because of you? Have you made him known to them? 
The people on planet Earth that have the greatest impact aren't typically the ones that is uh, talked about on television. They're the ones behind the scenes that understand why they were created and therefore they bring delight to the Lord by pouring into other people. Are you pouring into other people in obedience to the Lord? You exist because God said yes to you. In John chapter 1, I read a moment ago from verses 1 through 3. I've read verse 14. I now want to read verses 12 and 13, and here's what they say. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Those that become children of God are those that are born of the will of God. If you're born again, you have much to say thank you for. And you're not just saved. Saved, you're like the rest of us that are saved, but you are unique in your gifts, talents, abilities, personality, temperament, experiences. You're special. Shine for Jesus by yielding to him, realizing that I was created by him and through him and for him. I was not created for me to have a certain career. I was not created for me to live a certain length of time per se. I was created to bring honor and glory to him. That, that's why I'm here. If you're born of God, you have much to give praise for. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. And you who know the Lord, I encourage you to spend time in prayer praising the Lord for his goodness. That you are uniquely created by him and for him. If you've never been born of God, then you're not a Christian according to God's word. But you can be today. You can be born spiritually today. Will you acknowledge your sin? Will you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your creator and sustainer? The one that's given you life and keeps you alive. Will you acknowledge him that he bled and died on the cross to pay for your sin? And will you now turn from your sin and confess him as your Lord? Receiving him as your savior. If so, then on the authority of God's word, he will save your soul. You will be born of God today. And you'll be able to live out the rest of your days for the one that created you and saved you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? Do you know Jesus? If not, you can call on the name of the Lord right where you're sitting right now. You can ask him to save your soul. Say, Jesus, I am a sinner. And I fall short of your standard. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve heaven. But Jesus, you paid the ransom for me. You paid my debt. And now apply it to me, God. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. Save my soul. If that's the the desire of your heart, with all that you have and all that you are, As you express your love for God and your desire for him to save you on the authority of God's word, he will save you. In just a moment when we stand and sing, would you come and share with a pastor? You don't have to give a speech in front of hundreds of people. Come share with a pastor. God, just save my soul. Maybe you've been saved at another time and you need to make that public today by sharing with a pastor. Maybe you're saying, I want to be saved, but I'm I'm still not sure. I have questions or concerns. I'm not understanding. Whatever the case may be, when we stand and sing, come share that with a pastor, and we will further counsel you and help you to understand how great Jesus is in your need of him. You were created for him. Are you living for him? Believer, you were created for Jesus. Are you living for him? Are you bringing honor and glory to him? 
Is he your authority? Is he the one that you delight in pleasing? Is he the one that you have reverential fear for and awe of? If not, you can repent and be restored to a right frame of mind and a right standing with holy God. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Move on our hearts. Draw everyone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior unto salvation today. Do it now, O God. Save them as they are there sitting. Lead them to call upon you as Lord and Savior. Speak to the saved and those that need to be convicted, convict them. Those that need to be encouraged, encourage them that they have worth. That they were worth Jesus bleeding and dying to save them. And so, Lord God, lead them. Lead us all to live surrendered lives to our Creator and Sustainer. For we acknowledge we were created by Jesus and for Jesus. This is our prayer and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.